death squads, political assassinations, until recently mainly associated with South American dictatorships. Today, South Africa has that dubious honor. Black consciousness took root after the ANC and PAC went underground and into exile. The silence of the 1960s was transformed into a powerful new voice in the 1970s. Black consciousness spread among students, journalists, intellectuals, artists. Onkhopotse Abram Tiro, a Turf Loop graduate, was one of the first Sasso leaders to die for his belief in black pride. In 1974, he was assassinated by a parcel bomb after he had fled to Botswana. They said to me, your son is dead. He tried to open a parcel and the parcel killed him. From there, I took initiatives to go to Botswana. I saw my son in pieces. The police from Botswana helped me a lot. They gathered all the pieces. Only a few pieces were left there, and they took that to the mortuary. Now I wanted to make arrangements for his funeral. We were a family together, planning all the funeral arrangements. And we asked the South African government to give us a permission to transport him to South Africa to bury him here. And they said no. To this day, there is no clarity as to who ordered or delivered the parcel bomb. I have a request. Can you please investigate who really killed my, my son? Or maybe God may help you and, and find him. In April 1989, Witz anthropologist and human rights activist Dr. David Webster wrote a report on repression in South Africa. It contained details of disappearances and assassinations. He called it apartheid's ultimate weapon. On Workers' Day 1989, Webster fell victim to apartheid's ultimate weapon himself. His partner, Maggie Friedman, was there. It was the 1st of May, 1989, which is seven years ago this week. And it was a public holiday, almost the first real workers there. And David and I left the house early in the morning with our two dogs to go running in David's barkey and we returned to the house at about 10 o'clock in the morning. And David was driving. He parked the car in our street in front of our house. And he got out of the car to go around to the back to let the dogs out of the car. And I was getting out more slowly on the passenger side. And I was aware of a car coming down the street. And then I heard what I thought was a car backfiring and it accelerated down the street. And it only was afterwards I realized something was wrong when I saw that David was staggering and he was holding his chest in the front. And he said to me, I've been shot by a shotgun, get an ambulance. So David obviously saw his killers, he saw the weapon that killed him. The chain of command and hence responsibility for these illegal acts and conspiracies reached high into the structures of the state and government and certainly included cabinet ministers, military intelligence, the CCB, the South African police, the State Security Council. I believe that David Webster's murder was ordered and planned from within state structures. So I call for the indictment and prosecution of the following people. Firstly, those immediately involved in the assassination. So the CCB Region 6 operatives, Vota Basson, also known as Christo Britz, Stahl Berger, Chappie Marie, Ferdy Barnard, Kalaburta, Slang Vanzel. I would also have included Eugene Riley, who has since died a violent death, allegedly by suicide. And secondly, those having responsibility and knowledge of the planning of the assassination. Magnus Milan, the Minister of Defence, Eddie Webb, the head of the CCB, 
who has been obliged to apply for amnesty for perjury in his own cover-up evidence, Joe Fastair, the managing director of the CCB, Vidkop Bardenhorst, the chief of staff operations and direct superior of Eddie Webb. Further, I believe the following people have been involved in collaborating in the cover-up of information. Krappi Zengelbrecht, who told CCB members in detention not to talk about CCB activities. And Louis Harms, who was able to find that no hit squads operated out of flat class and who, in my mind, steered his commission so firmly away from the evidence. The list is much longer than Ongepotse Tiro and David Webster. Most of these assassinations were planned and executed by military and police death squads in Gauteng. Like Flakplas and Daisy, its counterpart for foreign operations, and the CCB base on a small holding near Pretoria. Much is known about Flakplas and its commander, Colonel Eugene de Kock, now on trial on 121 charges of fraud and murder. De Kock decided to kill his Flakplas predecessor, Dirk Kutsia, who had spilled the beans on death squads and had to flee the country. The Flakplas men built a bomb in a Walkman and mailed it to Kutsia in Lusaka. Kutsia thought the parcel suspicious and refused to accept it. It was sent back to the man whose name was put on it as sender by de Kock's men, lawyer and ANC activist Bekim Klangeni. Klangeni and Kutsia had met earlier to talk about hit squad activities. On February 15, 1991, Klangeni picked up the parcel from his office and went to watch a movie with his wife of two months, Sapati. From there we went to a tea room, we sat down there, he took out this parcel because it had been wrapped but it was obvious that it was almost unwrapped and there was a small box with cassettes. One of the boxes was written, Evidence Hit Squad. He said he's received this parcel. You might find that there's no evidence here that they are talking about, there's nothing in this cassette. So we took a taxi and we went home. When we arrived at home, he didn't even stay. I was undressing at that time. He just, as we connected the earphones. Take your time. I saw him, I saw him connecting these earphones. He didn't hear me because the last thing I said to him, why doesn't he put it onto the hypha so that I could also listen? I don't even think he even heard a thing of what happened, what was in the cassette. Of course, within seconds, I had a big explosion, big noise. I thought it was a gun. I ran away. I ran away. I tried to come out of the window, and then I couldn't get out of the window, and I came through the door to see him. The last thing I saw. I just saw him falling down slowly. After the police were there, they were looking for a statement. When I came back, I just saw two ambulances. And I began to hope. I was confused. I just I, 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 I completely confused at that stage that he had put on earphones. I thought this ambulance, as they were going out, he was also in one of those ambulances. When I went inside, stop for a while, I think. My daughter and I came rushing and just said, Peggy. I just said, what's wrong with Peggy? My daughter and I just said, Mama, Peggy at the garage. I was surprised what's this garage story about. I couldn't hear anything. I was feeling very ill. When I came out, they held me. They said, please don't go in there. I just skipped through their legs and went in. I found Peggy. He was in pieces. He was hanging on Katniss. He was all over. Pieces of him and brains, all of it was scattered around. 
That was the end of Peggy. The person who did this has been found. I want this person to come out, and this person is already on trial, is Eugene de Kock. But I would like the commission to find out from him. I'm not clear how Beggy's name got involved as a sender in the parcel. Another thing that's not clear in my mind, when they send this parcel to Dekuzi, as it was Eugene, uh, I mean, who claims he wanted to kill Dekuzi, he was an expert. expert. He was an expert in making bombs. When we read about letter bombs, how could he have sent Dekuzi a puzzle bomb, a clever like him, an expert? Didn't he know that this thing could come back to Beggy? What I do want to find out, how did they get Beggy's name involved in this? Eugene de Kock says he's going to ask amnesty from you. I, I, I contest this. Eugene, when he did what he did, he knew. He knew that somebody would die. Today, I'm a widow. I'm an outcast. I'm an outcast in, in our society. Because in I'm a widow. Community, in, in, our our in our community, in our society. You are associated with all sorts of Just things when you're a widow. Of Umundu, because of a person who didn't think through when they were doing this. To, so that when this person comes to you to ask for amnesty, how do you forgive such a person? If I can find an answer to this question, how do you go about forgiving this person who is a cruel murderer, who killed a defenseless person, who would never killed anyone, a person who never raped anyone, a person who never committed any crime, was just fighting for people's rights but without carrying a gun? Parcel bombs have often been used by the security police in their war against the ANC, especially by their foreign division at Daisy. Commanded in the 1980s by former Steve Biko interrogator Colonel Piet Hussen and super spy Major Craig Williamson. Williamson has admitted that he was responsible for two parcel bombs that killed two women and a six year old child. Williamson has applied for amnesty at the Truth Commission. The security police wanted to kill ANC activist Marius Squin. They sent a parcel bomb to his home in Angola. He wasn't at home when the parcel arrived, and his wife Jeanette opened it. It killed her and their daughter, Katrain. Williamson also admits killing leading ANC theoretician Ruth First, wife of Communist Party leader and later cabinet minister Joe Slovo. First was blown up in the Mozambican capital of Maputo in August 1982. Mozambique was an important hunting ground for South African death squads. This country nearly lost one of its most celebrated sons when a CCB unit, commanded by this man, Peter Boetus, decided to kill academic Albi Sachs, today a constitutional court judge. Maputo, 7 April 1988. In a moment of darkness, Sachs loses his arm. Four ribs are broken, his right heel fractured, his liver lacerated, his eardrums ruptured, his body full of shrapnel wounds. But he survives. Although Burtis has admitted complicity in the attack which was planned in this country, he has never been charged. Neither has the squad of CCB men who at the Harms Commission admitted they were involved in sabotage, conspiracy to murder, attempted murder and arson. But Pretoria's tentacles of death stretched far beyond the borders of the subcontinent. In March 1988, the ANC's representative in Paris, Dulce September, was gunned down. Pretoria denied complicity, but five years later a notorious South African gunrunner and police agent, Dirk Stofberg, admitted that he had arranged September's assassination.